Okay, so this is part two of my March wrap-up uh, because I read a lot of books this month. First thing I want to do is appreciate just how wonderfully cheesy this book cover is. I mean, just admire those rippling pectorals. Secondly, let's remember to not judge a book by its cover. This is Memories of Ice by Stephen Erickson, who is a Canadian novelist. He trained as an archaeologist and anthropologist before graduating from the Iowa Writers' Workshop. Memories of Ice is the third book out of ten in the Malazan Book of the Fallen series. So if it were not for a friend of mine who sang the praises of this series, I would never have picked it up. Just, I know, based on the cover, I was being judgmental. Large fantasy series with really cheesy covers, I just kind of assume there's no female characters, or if there are, they have no personality, a lot of action with little substance, so I was being very, very judgy. But I trust the taste of my friend, and I'm glad I do, because I really enjoy this series so far. The Malazan Book of the Fallen begins with the book Gardens of the Moon, which was published in 1999. Steven Erickson and his friend Ian C. Esselmont initially created the Malazan world as a backdrop for a tabletop RPG. Then they converted the world into a movie script because they were unhappy with the lack of quality fantasy movies aimed at an adult audience. Actually, what has happened to fantasy movies? When I look like on Netflix or Hulu or whatever, they all seem to be under sci-fi. Do they make fantasy movies for adults anymore? because I would like some. The script for Gardens of the Moon failed to sell because it was seen as too big a risk, so the guys finally converted the script into a novel. And you can tell. Oh boy, can you tell. The writing of the first book is not great. It's fine. The overwhelming use of needless prepositions like just drove me absolutely crazy. The quality of the writing does improve as the series progresses, the biggest jump being from the first to the second book. And I think, I mean, the purpose of the series is not to admire the writing, right? It's about a lot of things, but it's not about that. I think it's a generally accepted opinion among people who have read the series that you have to kind of get through the first book and then read the second to discover if the series is really for you or not. So why, as a self-professed prose over plot reader, did I finish the first book, much less continue to read the series, and find great enjoyment in it? Well, that's a multifaceted explanation. So why did I decide to invest the time required to read a 657-page book, followed by a 604-page book, just to figure out if I would even like this series? Also, why am I phrasing everything in question? <laughs> because I'm a sucker for a big book, seriously. Just wave any large book in front of my face and I'll be like, mm, yes, please, give that to me. But also, the soft, lovely hum that I feel in my brain when I am reading a book just filled with wonderful prose and or interesting and difficult concepts. This series also produces, but for different reasons. So obviously, if I am now reviewing the third book of the series, I have read the first two books and was successfully seduced into continuing this massive series. And boy, do I mean massive. As I've mentioned, the page count of these books is nothing to laugh at. And look how tiny the print is. But what I really mean is that the characters that fill these pages are so numerous and diverse. Song of Ice and Fire, uh, aka Game of Thrones, has nothing on the character count of the Malazan Book of the Fallen series. And the thing is, every character is distinct and relevant. There are no Lord of the Rings insert random personality-less character to deliver an important message, you know, here types. Uh, nobody is a throwaway, and yet new characters are constantly being introduced. Also, the characters are compelling, uh, I think mostly because everybody is vulnerable. There are no strongmen heroes in this series. You can see the cracks in everyone's armor, uh, sometimes literally. Also, there are so many women characters. Who knew that a fantasy series older than like five years would contain so many women characters? And not the mystical shining ladies or impossibly beautiful princesses, but warriors and noble women and politicians and thieves and prostitutes and just you name it, they're in here. And not only that, the women are all shapes and sizes. They're not all like tiny, skinny, or tall and with long hair. Like they all, they look different and interesting. So that hum I want to feel in my brain when I am reading a difficult book, 
I feel that when reading this series, because of the sheer amount of information between the world building and the knowledge you need to have of the characters, uh, that needs to be retained to have any understanding of what you're reading on any page. Although this is a pretty classic medieval-esque fantasy with high magic and politics and epic battles, it contains some really unique features, my favorite being the Azath houses, which are these houses that can be born and killed and they defy the laws of space and time. Another thing I love is that the series does not pander to the reader. You really have to pay attention to what you're reading, you're often thrown right in the middle, of a plot line or a situation with no expletive introduction as to what you the reader are doing here. Something will be mentioned in one sentence in one book and then come to have huge importance much later on. There are many aspects of the world that are never explained because the characters themselves don't know how some of the things work, for instance the Azath houses, or how humans can ascend to godhood. They know what happens, but nobody can really give you the prescription for how to become a god. There is a lot of room left to the reader for interpretation and theorizing, so all of this is to say if you want to read a series that will make your brain whirl and has a great and varied cast of characters, give this one a try. So, much like the Azath houses I mentioned in the Malazan Book of the Fallen, Carmen Mario Machado also found herself stuck in a house devoid of logic and reason, which she detailed in her memoir in the Dream House. In the Dream House was first published by Grey Wolf Press in 2019. Grey Wolf Press publishes a variety of really great literary nonfiction, so I suggest you check them out. If you are the one person who has not heard of this book, it is about Machado and the abusive same-sex relationship that she endured and struggled to free herself from. I had read Machado's short story collection, Her Body and Other Parties, in anticipation of this book and was pretty underwhelmed by it but I think she knocked it out of the park with In the Dream House. Abuse is such a difficult subject to communicate uh, for many reasons, but I think a majority of that difficulty comes from the impossibility of imparting any kind of concrete definition onto abuse. There is a wide and diverse spectrum of abuse, and there is no hard line between what is and what is not abuse. Machado puts into words what I think many people who have suffered abuse from a loved one have always struggled or found impossible to communicate, and she does it so smartly and gracefully and creatively. And not only does Machado do all this when dealing with abuse, but dealing with abuse specifically between two women. There is a fable our society perpetuates of the Edenic lesbian relationship, that lesbian relationships are somehow less messy and complicated than other kinds of romantic relationships. This thinking is in line with the thing we do where when we want to defend a minority, we erase their human imperfections and put them on a pedestal. For instance, Immigrants commit less crimes than American-born citizens, which is true, but that shouldn't be the point. The point should be that immigrants are humans and should have the same rights and opportunities available to them as anybody else. So here is a great passage about how being a lesbian or any minority is just another barrier to being able to talk about abuse. We deserve to have our wrongdoing represented as much as our heroism. Because when we refuse wrongdoing as a possibility for a group of people, we refuse their humanity. That is to say, queers, real-life ones, do not deserve representation, protection, and rights because they are morally pure or upright as people. They deserve those things because they are human beings, and that is enough." So Machado has cleverly organized her memoir into small, I suppose you could call them essays, although that's not quite what they are, uh, that dissect different narrative tropes. In one instance, she uses the classic tale of Bluebeard as an illustration of how abuse can escalate that I found to be quite perfect. It's a bit long, but I think it's worth reading out loud. Bluebeard's greatest lie was that there was only one rule. The newest wife could do anything she wanted, anything, as long as she didn't do that single, arbitrary thing, didn't stick that tiny, inconsequential key into that tiny, inconsequential lock. But we all know that was just the beginning, a test. She failed and lived to tell the tale as I have. But even if she'd passed, even if she'd listened, there would have been some other request a little larger, a little stranger, and if she'd kept going, kept allowing herself to be trained, like a corset fanatic pinching her waist smaller and smaller, there'd have been a scene where Bluebeard danced around with the rotting corpses of his past wives clasped in his arms, and the newest wife would have sat there mutely, suppressing growing horror, swallowing the egg of vomit that bobbed behind her breastbone. And then later, another scene, in which he did unspeakable things to the bodies, women, they'd once been women, 
and she just stared dead into the middle distance, seeking some mute purgatory where she could live forever. And to fast forward a bit, this is the conclusion. This is how you are toughened, the newest wife reasoned. This is where the tenacity of love is practiced, its tensile strength, its durability. You are being tested and you are passing the test, sweet girl, sweet self. Look how good you are, look how loyal, look how loved. The mention of swallowing the egg of vomit that bobbed behind her breastbone reminds me of the Dutch limited series on Netflix called Eras. Uh, it's really good. I suggest you watch it. But back to Machado, um, just a great book. I think everybody should read it. So The Unreality of Memory and Other Essays is by Alyssa Gabbert and was published in 2020. The synopsis from Goodreads says, The unreality of memory collects provocative, searching essays on disaster culture, climate anxiety, and our mounting collective sense of doom. In this new collection, acclaimed poet and essayist Alyssa Gabbert explores our obsessions with disasters past and future, from the sinking of the Titanic to Chernobyl, from witch hunts to the plague. These deeply researched, prophetic meditations question how the world will end, if indeed it will, and why we can't stop fantasizing about it. This is one of those books that I was very engrossed in while reading, but then promptly forgot about once I was finished. I think part of that is how, of the time, this book feels. Nothing particularly resonated with me. These essays are very thoughtful, well-researched, and well-written, but just for me, were not memorable. Objectively speaking, I think this is a worthy collection of essays, but subjectively it just didn't quite hit the spot for me. Give it a try though and let me know what you think. So Lolly Willows is the first novel written by Sylvia Townsend Warner and it was initially published in 1926. Warner also wrote The Corner That Held Him, which I read last month and loved. Lolly Willows is about an unmarried middle-aged woman who lives with close relatives, as was the standard for spinsters <laughs> during the turn of the 20th century. A majority of the book details the domestic mundanities of everyday life and Lolly's slow realization that she wants to be independent from her family. Lolly decides to move to the country where she almost accidentally becomes a witch and has a few friendly conversations with Satan. After reading this book, I mentioned to a friend how many of my favorite books such as The Natural Margarita by Mithra Balkagov and Unplay by T.F. Powis contained normal people having casual conversations with Satan and that I wish that was a genre on its own. As it turns out, Warner was friends with Powis and the two supported each other's writing careers. Warner had an interesting life. Before she devoted herself to writing, she was a musicologist and focused on music from the 15th and 16th centuries. She lived with her partner, Valentine Ackland, from 1930 until Valentine's death in 1969. Both women were active in the Communist Party for some time, especially amidst the rise of fascism. But Warner eventually became disillusioned with the party. Throughout her writing career, Warner often returned to certain themes, such as a rejection of Christianity, the place of women in a patriarchal society, and sexually ambiguous characters. Her writing is so beautiful. It's entertaining, humorous, insightful, and while some people are very turned off by her rejection of traditional plot structures, as most of her stories have only the slightest narrative scaffolding, if any at all, I think her stories flow in a way that plot would only erode. I equate her writing style to pointillism. She was able to magnify tiny, seemingly insignificant moments in a character's life and expand those moments to become significant in a way that each dot of paint in a pointillist painting is essential to create the effect of a whole when seen from a distance. I know that's a bit of a cheesy simile. We forget most of our lives because most of our lives are filled with moments that take place every day with just the subtlest of differences between them, but these moments when gathered together shape so much of our lives. Okay, I'll stop waxing poetic. Uh, Sylvia Townsend Warner, give her a read. The Wine Dart Seas, a collection of weird tales by Robert Aikman. Faber and Faber has gathered nearly all of Aikman's stories in four collections, each with its own lovely monochrome cover. I really love these covers. Aikman was a writer of esoteric nonchalant, uh, surreal, often ambiguous horror stories, although he preferred the term strange stories. Aikman was born in 1914 in London and died in 1981. I read the New York Review Books collection of his previously unpublished stories, Compulsory Games, last year, and I was hooked. Uh, he has this story about zombies, but through the lens of bureaucracy and how bureaucracy can so often fail, uh, and it was just 
I just thought it was brilliant. I intend to read the full catalog of his short stories. Aikman's writing style is pretty divisive. His writing style definitely leans more towards literary, and it seems that people who don't like his stories point to the almost universal lack of climactic or definitive conclusions. But that is one of the many things I love about Aikman's work. He doesn't write to shock the reader with some big ending. Also, Aikman gives room in his stories to establish character, which is something I find is often missing from supernatural and horror tales. In many works I've read within those genres, characters tend to be a means of conveying weirdness or horror rather than being actual fleshed out characters. Sorry, I can't really say the word horror. Horror. Like a normal person. I have I'm weird with R's. In other words, Aikman's stories have a great deal of nuance and are often explorations of rather mundane ideas viewed through the lens of the supernatural or are supernatural ideas explored through the lens of the mundane. If that sounds like your cup of tea, give Aikman a try. And finally, Last Call by Tim Powers. I actually DNF'd this one uh, through no fault of this book. I think Tim Powers is a good writer. I think he writes good stories, but he's definitely a writer who writes strictly for plot and I'm just not feeling that right now. I would suggest this book if you do not need, you know, beautiful meandering sentences, you just want to know what's happening, I think, and you like weirdness, I think Tim Powers is definitely for you. Last Call is about a... <laughs> how do you explain this? Let's see what the back says. A lifetime ago, dark magic destroyed the Fisher King, Bugsy Siegel, and a new lord arose to rule the Las Vegas wasteland. Twenty years ago, one-eyed gambler Scott Crane locked his body and soul in a bizarre floating card game in the middle of Lake Mead, and now the winner has come to collect. I think what I read of this book I thought was fun, I just, in the end, I just wanted to read other things. Uh, this book was first published in 1992. Tim Powers is a science fiction and fantasy author. He usually writes books with esoteric kind of fun pseudoscientific themes. He likes complex plots. He likes to put in lots of literary references. I think Tim Powers actually does a lot of research before writing any of his books um, because he does like to include historical people in his books but then you know make it kind of fantastical. I don't know if Tim Powers is actively writing anymore. I think most of his books have were published in the 80s and 90s but I definitely do recommend him. If you're into you know fun fast-paced uh, fantasy, sci-fi, weirdness, I definitely suggest you give Tim Powers a try. Alright, that's all for today. Thanks for watching. Bye.